Now a forum on the image of Muslims in the U.S. hosted by the Congressional Muslim Staff Association. Speakers include James Zogby, head of the Arab American Institute. This is about an hour and a half. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Zasa Akhtar. I'm the president of the Congressional Muslim Staff Association, otherwise known as the CMSA. And we uh, welcome you to our briefing, Muslims in America, Myths and Realities. Um, we have a distinguished panel here before us to talk about what we call it a discussion on faith in the wake of the Park 51 controversy. Now, I want to be clear that this briefing is not about Park 51. None of the panelists here are, are experts on the project or connected to the project directly. This is not about Park 51, the Congressional Muslim Staff Association uh, does not take a position on the Park 51 project, nor do we uh, necessarily endorsing the positions of the panels here. The Muslim Staff Association uh, wants to bring together uh, experts and community leaders and others to talk about the conversation that's taking place in the wake of the, this controversy, the controversy, kind of conversation that's taking place all across America about faith and about where Muslim Americans stand. Uh, and it's a complex conversation that we're having right now. Uh, the Muslim Staff Association was, uh, represents all the Muslims who work on Capitol Hill in congressional offices, legislative offices, and uh, in the many support offices. When we started the CMSA more than four years ago, uh, the first event that we had was uh, in the wake of the Danish cartoon controversy that was sweeping across Europe and throughout much of the world. And we screened a documentary uh, for the Capitol Hill community of the PBS documentary, Legacy of a Prophet, about Prophet Muhammad. In order to offer some education and information to the community, to the larger Capitol Hill community about what's going on and about who Muslims are and, the, and the, the conversation that's happening again at that time. But the one that's happening now is happening directly on our shores and as Americans. And as Muslim Americans who, who live here, who work here, who've grown up here, um, you know, this is something that we can innately speak about directly. And we're very uh, honored to have this distinguished panel before us to talk about uh, this larger conversation happening in America. And it's one that's complex. It's not simple. Uh, in a Time Magazine poll that was taken a few weeks ago, they asked, do you favor or oppose a mosque near Ground Zero? 26% favored, 61% opposed, and this was, widely, uh, this was widely disseminated in the public. But two, two statistics that weren't in the same poll, in that same poll, the same people uh, who said that, said, would you favor or oppose a mosque in your own neighborhood? And by a 55 to 34% margin, they said they would favor a mosque in their own neighborhood, in their own communities. In the same poll, they asked, would you say that most U.S. Muslims are patriotic Americans? By 55 to 25 percent margin, more than two to one, they said yes, that most Muslim Americans are patriotic Americans. So this is not a simple conversation as the media would have us believe that this is one-sided or in one way. It's complex. And this is a conversation I think the panelists can speak to that's, been hap that's happened in America many times before. Uh, Mr. Suhail Khan, who's our moderator today, uh, I'm proud to say worked on Capitol Hill and started um, the uh, Capitol Hill Jummah prayer, the Friday prayer, uh, in which every Friday Muslims uh, in, in Washington, D.C. area and from, from all parts of the country uh, come to pray under the Capitol Dome every Friday. And we've had this for, for more than a decade. And uh, we've had visitors from around the world, the State Department has brought visitors from around the world to this Friday prayer. We've had visitors from Muslim-majority countries places where there's 90% Muslims, where they can't pray in public or, or def, certainly not in a government building. And they're amazed and they're, they're saddened by their own plight at home. So regardless of the, the uh, adversity that we face at home, and at times it's been stifling, at times there's been violence and, and, and uh, desecration of, of mosques and opposition, but whatever adversity we face, there can be no doubt that we're blessed to be Americans and blessed to be able to practice our faith in this country. And, um, and adversity is the key. And adversity is the key because we know it's the story in faith as it is in America from the very founding of our nation that without adversity there can be no progress. And that's progress is what we're seeking and that's the conversation that we're seeking here today with the panel that we have assembled. So I thank you all for being here again today. I won't take up any further time. I want to introduce our moderator for this uh, conversation, Mr. Suhail Khan, who worked on Capitol Hill for, 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 uh, for, for many years and was a figure, major figure in the Bush administration, both at the White House and Department of Transportation, and is now a senior fellow at the Institute for Global Engagement. 
Uh, I'm proud to uh, say that I always enjoy doing events with him, not only because he's a good man, uh, but because I can say that, that we have bipartisan cooperation on anything we do. So without any further ado, Mr. Suhail Khan. Thank you. Thanks, Asad. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out this morning on this very important topic. And um, Asad very ably laid out the issues here. The uh, controversies surrounding the Park 51 Community Center in Lower Manhattan has really sparked a national debate on a host of issues beyond just the construction of a community center in Lower Manhattan. And a lot of the questions that a lot of folks have been asking themselves have kind of come to the national conversation, including what is the role of Islam in America? Who are American Muslims? What do they want? What are their aspirations and goals? And some of the even more tougher questions have begun to really surface, including what is the role of terrorism? Uh, is there a relationship to terrorism and Islam? Is, are Muslims inherently violent? These are some of the questions that were asked in the Time Magazine article from two weeks ago. And then even other questions related to the role of women in Islam. And I've seen even now what was on the fringe, perhaps just in, uh, you know, in chat rooms and on the internet, has now kind of surfaced and bubbled up, as Asad said, to the mainstream conversation, to the point where mainstream politicians are now accusing Muslims of somehow being a fifth column, somehow not being capable of being loyal as Americans, that they might have uh, inherent conflicts in their faith as far as their loyalties. And there are all kinds of accusations that are swirling around. So what we thought here is that we would assemble a panel of experts who can really take on some of these myths, challenge some of these myths, and really shed light on some of these issues that have come up. So what I thought I'd do is go ahead and introduce the panel, and they will each speak for a brief uh, 10 to 15 minutes, and then we can go right to the Q&A so we can have a, a real good conversation about some of the issues that are on people's minds. And um, before we go with that, I just want to remind folks, since we are live on uh, being taped here, that if we could uh, turn off cell phones and pagers so that we don't have any interruptions, that would be helpful. But uh, I'll introduce our panelists, if I could. Uh, our first panelist, to, I'll go in order, um, is, uh, is uh, Salam al Mariati. Salam is the president of MPAC, the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Uh, they have offices all over the country, including here in Washington, D.C., and in Los Angeles. Salam has been a, a champion for uh, issues related to the Muslim American community for over two decades. And uh, he resides in Los Angeles with his wife, but he's, he's a fixture here in Washington, D.C. as well in public policy forums, working with the executive branch as well as on Capitol Hill. And he will uh, discuss issues related to uh, just basic overview of the role of Muslims, their life in, in the United States, challenges. Are they in any way unique or different than every other day Americans? And then next up, we have Professor Aziz Hebri who is the uh, professor of law at the University of Richmond Law School. She's also the founder and chairman of Karama, a Muslim women's advocacy organization. And she will be especially uh, able to address issues related to Islam and the law. We have a lot of questions and myths related to Sharia uh, and questions related to Sharia. Uh, I always say that um, you know, Sharia is like when you're a kid and you kind of learn a dirty word and you keep going on re wanting to repeat it. About five, six years ago, the word related to Islam that a lot of people want to repeat was the word Wahhabism. And you heard that all the time. Everybody was a Wahhabi. I had to look it up when I was accused of being a Wahhabi. Uh, and now the new dirty word is Sharia. And uh, I thought Professor uh, al Hibri could address some of the issues and some of the questions related to Sharia, what exactly that is, and do... Muslims, in fact, want to impose Sharia upon everybody else. And last up, our speaker is Dr. Jim Zogby, the uh, founder and president of the Arab American Institute, who really has been a pioneer. If, if Salam has been working for 20 years, Jim's been working for over 30 in the trenches, really trying to empower Americans of all backgrounds and faiths, particularly in the Arab American community. Uh, he's uh, unique in that he's uh, Arab American, but also Irish also Catholic, so he's seen this movie before, as it were, and I thought he might be able to provide a historical context of some of the challenges we're facing right now. But with that, let me start with Salam, and we'll proceed down. Thank you, and good morning. Well, uh, I'm going to be talking about the Muslim American community and, and Islam, but I'm going to try to tie it into the Park 51 controversy uh, because I know there are a lot of questions that arise from that 
issue. And uh, first and foremost is this, uh, the, the nomenclature of this uh, uh, particular controversy. It started out as the ground zero moth controversy. And I think by, by now everybody acknowledges that the place is not at ground zero and it is not a mosque. Uh, it, it is uh, a few blocks away where you can't even see ground zero and uh, it is a community center that was actually intended to develop interfaith understanding. And I think that's important because a lot of Muslim American institutions now uh, are doing exactly that. They're reaching out to their fellow neighbors, to Christians and Jews in their local communities uh, and developing interfaith understanding and tackling issues such as poverty, homelessness, any kind of injustice. Uh, and trying to develop better dialogue among uh, the, the three Abrahamic faiths as Islam, Christianity, and Judaism uh, are all rooted in uh, Abraham as really the, the father uh, of these three great religions. Um, but the fact is that it was called the Ground Zero Mosque and that obviously caused a lot of consternation. Um, and here we have to distinguish between truth and fact. Uh, the truth is it's not on ground zero, it's not a mosque, it's a community center. Uh, and the fact is it was called that so as you repeat the facts uh, it becomes reality and we have to deal with these realities. Now moving away from this controversy you see demonstrations against mosques and Muslims throughout the country. And I think the one issue that we have to be very concerned about uh, as Americans is the burn of the burning the Quran day um, on 9-11 uh, in particular uh, in, uh, particularly in Gainesville Florida where there will be a, pre, uh, a reverend a religious uh, Christian religious leader who will sponsor burning the the Quran day uh, and this is a obviously a, a major issue for us but as Muslims we have told our congregations told Muslim Americans, ignore that, keep doing your good work because this is what the Quran tells us to do. Uh, but as Americans, we should be very concerned about that because first and foremost, I think people need to understand that what is the Quran. The Quran basically is a, um, what Muslims consider a revelation from God, just as Jesus is the word of God uh, that Muslims believe in. Uh, Muhammad was given this revelation that was basically uh, compiled into the Quran today. And within the Quran, there are stories about Abraham, about Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob, about Moses and the children of Israel. We read during Ramadan, the Quran, uh, quite extensively about the struggle of the children of Israel against the pharaohs and against uh, the tyranny and the injustice there and how they were liberated. We read about Jesus and his mother, Mary. So really the biblical prophets are also Islam's prophets. And I don't think many Americans are aware uh, of that. And we take responsibility of, as Muslims of not presenting that kind of information uh, to people. So we have, uh, as a result, this burning the, the Quran day. And what we are telling Muslims, uh, number one, to ignore, and number two, if somebody's burning anything in your neighborhood, the first thing you do is call the fire department because that's a fire hazard. Um, uh, but obviously, the images of that cause even greater problems for us as Americans because could you imagine now in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, images of Americans burning the Quran? How now that is propaganda and recruiting material for Al-Qaeda and other violent extremists. And here's an important point for us to make then, that anti-Muslim sentiment is in America is basically a mirror of anti-American sentiment on the global arena. So as anti-Muslim sentiment spikes here in America, then you can expect a spike of anti-American sentiment abroad. And now we, we see several counterterrorism um, experts talking about how this is really undermining our efforts uh, throughout the world and putting more Americans in harm's way. Uh, and I think this issue of Islamophobia then has to be viewed as an American problem, not just as a Muslim problem. Now, Pew uh, has conducted a study that 70% of the American public 
has either an unfavorable view or no opinion on Islam. Uh, and here, I think the problem is, is that the extremists are able to tell their stories more effectively than the Muslim American community can tell its story. Because the Muslim American story still has not been told in terms of who we are, what we represent, how we want to contribute to American society. Yet, if some guy in some cave in a faraway place decides to make a video that curses America, that talks about bombing innocent lives uh, anywhere in any part of the world, if it's uh, bin Laden or, or somebody from a Shabab in Somalia, if that tape is made, then within minutes, instantaneously, you get that video played over and over again in all U.S. markets. Yet, if we as Muslim Americans, which we have done so many times, talking about our efforts, and we have a paper for you today called Building Bridges uh, in terms of partnership uh, in developing America's national security, we continue to do that work. We've had several condemnations of terrorism uh, throughout the years, even before 9-11. That story is still not told. But in the broader sense, and let me just end with two points, um, there is a problem between religious nationalism and religious pluralism. Religious nationalism, when a few, a small group of people, exploit religion using its popularity to serve selfish interests of a few and create violence, anarchy, chaos, and they exploit religion, and religion becomes uh, something without justice. Religion without justice, then, is exploitation. They want God to serve them. They do not serve God. Religious pluralism, on the other hand, is that we have the belief in one God, and therefore we believe in the one human family. And to believe in one God means that you have to support human equality. Whether people believe in God or don't believe in God, human equality is critical to the notion of the belief in one God. Therefore, God's will is one of racial and religious diversity. The Quran says, to each of you, we have made from among you different laws, and here the word sh sharia comes, shiratan, and different ways. And the Quran says, therefore, don't worry about your differences, just compete for doing good work. Um, and this diversity is very important for Muslims to understand as well as for us to explain to other people. And then very briefly in terms of Sharia, I know that Aziz al-Hibri, Professor Aziz, uh, Aziz al-Hibri will talk more extensively about that. Sharia simply means that the road or the way or the path to God. Uh, it's, a, it's a general term. Uh, but one person made an important statement about Sharia. Uh, well known in Islamic history. His name is uh, Ibn al Qayyim al Juziyya, who is a student of Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, and he says, When there is no justice, there is no Sharia. So if we're talking about the Sharia of what we see in the Middle East, when there is bias against women, when there is oppression and violence uh, against the weak uh, and vulnerable communities, that is not Sharia to us, and that is not what we want here in America, definitely. We will be first to, to stand up in opposition to that kind of exploitation of Islam. And another great scholar says, where there is no security, there is no Islam. Where there is security, that is where Islam is. And therefore, America to us is the best place for Muslims, and we will work to preserve our constitutional rights for all Americans. Thank you very much. Good morning. I really didn't intend to stand before you and talk about Sharia law. That's uh, put a lot of you to sleep because I treat it as a very serious legal discipline. <laughs> I thought I would start today by making a few comments about American law and Muslims in the United States. And feel free to ask about any questions of concern to you about Sharia law. I'm more than happy to answer those. But um, I got very much interested in the Founding Fathers uh, a, f a while back. And I went to Monticello and went to other places and looked in their papers and looked in the uh, Library of Congress letters and so on. 
And I found a lot of interesting stuff along the way, not only uh, as far as the uh, founding fathers, but the whole mood of the country in those days. And I was very surprised to find out, for example, that in, on the literary uh, level, um, there were plays written about attempts to liberate Muslim women who are oppressed in the East. You know, the, the talk about the harem and things like that. Uh, I found out that there were all sorts of suspicions expressed about Muslims. Um, I also found out, by the way, that there was an attempt at regime change by the United States in Tripoli, North Africa in the 18th century. Um, I found out that there were writings that Jefferson was aware of, uh, which called Islam a false religion and the prophet an imposter. A lot of this had happened for a while. It didn't just happen yesterday. And I think it's time that we take a deep breath and talk to each other as co-citizens and ask ourselves, how are we going to relate to each other? And what's the foundation of this historical misunderstanding? I do not want us to uh, push anything under the rug. Let's have an honest and healthy discussion in a country which believes in uh, the process of law, in the, a country of laws and a country of due process. This is what protects all of us. It's not just about an Islamic minority or a Muslim minority. It's about all minorities, and it's also about the conscience of the majority. Another big shock that I developed as I was reading uh, the history of this country, I walked along up the campus of my university to the Historical Baptist Society, and lo and behold, I found out that their leaders in their own time suffered quite a bit. And in fact, this, they're not the only uh, group that have suffered, Jews, Catholics, and I can name a lot of other minorities that have had it difficult getting stabilized in this country. So I guess, you know, we all go through this. But hopefully, as we mature in terms of our understanding of our Constitution, the process will become more dignified and, and less painful. So I want Muslims in this country to understand, in some way, they're not singled out. <laughs> Everybody else had to go through this one way or the other. The other thing is, and I'm talking to Muslims as well, is that, thankfully, the Founding Fathers had introduced, uh, through the insistence of a lot of religious groups who were Christian, uh, and atheist, by the way, and uh, uh, other religions, the First Amendment which has its origin in the Bill of Rights of Virginia, and I'm happy to say that since I teach in Virginia, and I'm very proud of that fact. So uh, what I'm asking for is a, double, is a double request. One is reassert our commitment to the First Amendment. Throughout history, it has shown that it is a very valuable part of what the U.S. is about. And in fact, I think this is one of the major attractions of the U.S. to immigrants who leave their countries. They love their countries and leave them because they truly believe that in this country they can have a free and dignified being that they have missed elsewhere. The Supreme Court throughout the years has again elaborated and emphasized the basic principles of the First Amendment. For example, in Lynch versus Donnelly, um, Chief uh, Justice Rehnquist emphasizes that political divisiveness, divisiveness alone, he stated, cannot serve to invalidate otherwise permissible conduct. So whatever we might feel about the person sitting next to us, they have rights. Even if we politically disagree, that's no reason to behave uh, in a way that would infringe on those rights. And furthermore, uh, the First Amendment uh, states, well, it doesn't state, but implies that the legislative powers of the government could reach actions only and not opinions. And so it's wonderful that we could all sit here, and I'm sure we, some of us will disagree on certain aspects of the discussion, but we are protected by the First Amendment in doing that. Um, One wonders uh, about the situation that has arisen recently with all sorts of broad misstatements and misinformation about Islam that Salam has referred to, and I'm sure others will talk about later today. 
But I'd like to point out that that misinformation does not only come from non-Muslims. It also comes from Muslims. That many Muslims themselves are misinformed about their religion. And that I feel that a major part of my responsibility in this country is to educate Muslims about what the Quran really says. For example, since I'm a woman and I'm committed to women's issues and women's dignity and, liber and liberation, I, uh, we at my organization, Karama, run classes in which we teach Muslim women and hopefully in the future men about the rights that are guaranteed to them by their own religion. What is surprising about all this is that most of the women we teach are surprised that they have all these rights. So there is a stereotype, a very negative stereotype about Islam that goes around. And it goes around even within the Muslim community because they don't see it as negative. They have misinformation about Islam, but they don't understand that this holy book, this Quran, has basically the principles of the First Amendment in it that historically Muslim uh, communities have practiced religious tolerance. This is nothing new. It did not start with the United States. It started many hundred years ago. It might not be, have been as good, as perfect a practice as, and it's not so perfect yet in the United States, but certainly it was done, and it was done in a, in a historical era when nobody else practiced it. So when Islam was tolerant and uh, welcomed diversity and used it to develop societies as opposed to uh, fight progress. You know, if, if Islam did that, how come we forgot all these important uh, achievements and instead we went to an authoritarian structure, a patriarchal understanding, um, and an understanding that has caused a lot of uh, pain, not only uh, for us in this country, but elsewhere. My message today is that we really need a serious conversation about Islam. And by that, I also include the Muslims uh, in this country and elsewhere. We need a serious conversation not based on the demagoguery of somebody or another telling us what they think Islam is, but on a serious study of the text of the Quran which shows, for example, that democracy is at the heart of Islam through the concept of shura, which is a consultative uh, uh, approach, through the uh, separation of powers, through the election of the head of state. None of this we see today uh, in, in Muslim countries, which is why I think Salam said that he feels this is a uh, most congenial country to be in for Muslims because it represents more of the principles of Islam that uh, we believe in. So if we are going to talk a little bit about Islamic law, I would mention one verse in the Quran which is paraphrased by Jefferson without reference to the Quran. So it could be that they just both, you know, that Jefferson thought of it on his own. Uh, but you all know that he, he did own a Quran, and I suppose if he owned it, he read it. Uh, there's a verse in the Quran which says, there is no compulsion in religion. That's the freedom of exercise, so that everybody is free to pick what they believe in. And he mentions that in his cyclopedia. The Quran also advocates what, what is referred to in the Quran as kalima, kalimat sawa, which is a fair word or equitable word with other religions. Communication. Even if somebody, the Quran says, talks to you or acts towards you in a way that is hostile, return the bad deed with a good one. So that ultimately, this person who is unhappy with you or hostile to you will one day become your friend. Because human beings, I would elaborate, are at, in the end good people. And if they understand that you're not out there to hurt them, and you are friendly, then they'll come around and talk to you. I'd like to see a serious conversation started in this country. The word Sharia law has been banded around as a, a threat. I don't know where this came from. Uh, why, why is it being discussed in the United States as a threat? Um, maybe you can enlighten me during the Q&A and I'd be happy to answer. But American Muslims have been living under the American laws for 
ever since you know, they came to this country, which, by the way, is before the 1600s. Uh, a lot of people think that Muslims are recent uh, visitors to this country or immigrants, which is not true. I would like to end by reading a verse from the Quran, which should guide all our actions, Muslim and non-Muslim alike. It's chapter 14, verses 24-25. It says, a goodly word is like a goodly tree, whose roots are firmly fixed, and its branches reach out to the heavens. It brings forth its fruits at all times by the leave of the Lord. So let us all strive for the good word. Thank you. Good morning. I, um my daughter, Mary Margaret, used to tease me um, about 10 years ago when I was 55. She'd say, uh, it must be fun being 55. You get to meet new people every day. It was an expression she started using because she introduced me to a friend, Kelly, one day. And a couple days later, Kelly was over again. And she said, y you met Kelly. And I said, I don't think so. She said, y y yeah, Dad, you did. It was two days ago. Um, I get that feeling when we have this discussion because um, it seems that every time there's a crisis, we have to start talking again about what is this all about and who are these people and what's this religion all about. And at some point, I think it'll begin to dawn on us that there's something we need to know and that we ought to pay attention to, but let's do it one more time. It was shortly after September 11th, uh, I was invited by Bill Clinton to NYU to a panel that he had organized on a topic identical to the one we're doing today. Americans were in shock, and people in New York in particular, and had a lot of questions that they wanted answered. Uh, we recognized the importance of dealing that, and so what we did with this panel was begin to talk about who Muslim Americans were. What I did before I went to the session is I called a lot of friends to get some anecdotes and sort of poured over my mind in the 30 years I've been doing this work and uh, got a doctorate in Islamic studies and uh, have organized Arab Americans for about uh, as long as I can remember and have been polling uh, Arab Americans and American Muslims. And so putting it all together, I, I told some stories about a young woman who was a pre-med student and idealist uh, par excellence who, who told me one day, she said, I'm not going to be like my father. I want to practice my religion by opening a clinic for the poor. And she said, that would be how I'd practice my faith. And then there was a guy, Ahmed, I knew in Cincinnati who reminded me so much of my father as he took me to the mosque that he had helped raise the money to build. And he was so proud of the building. Um, and he toured me around and showed me that he got this from Syria and he had that donated from Lebanon and he brought all these wonderful artifacts in. And it, like I said, it reminded me of my father and my uncles who built the Maronite Church in Utica, which is incidentally going to be celebrating a, a hundredth year anniversary of the parish community, not of the church itself. Um, and that sense that immigrants get the pride they have in building and sort of establishing their institutions in the new world. He died a couple years later. But then two years after he died, I had the opportunity to get his son an internship at the White House. And as we walked across Pennsylvania Avenue on his first day to work, um, the kid teared up and he said, only my dad could see me now. He'd be so proud. This is why he came to this country. There were other stories. A young Yemeni girl in Dearborn who, in the middle of Ramadan, there was a fight in the school it started because the principal insisted that the Muslim students had to go to cafeteria during lunchtime. The kids asked for the opportunity to go to a, a, a study hall. He said no. And so during the lunch period, kids were throwing ham at the Muslim students. And it was, of course, something, a provo pro provocation, which ultimately turned out to be a, a fight. Um, this 14-year-old girl, we had a town meeting, and she came to me and she said, I had the solution. I went to the principal and I told him, the problem is that we don't understand each other. And she said, they don't understand my culture. And so if you would help us, maybe we could explain our culture to them. And he snapped back at her, 
My job is not to have you teach your culture, girl. It's for you to learn my culture. She continued to fight, and she actually does the work that she had set out to do at 14 today as a full-time professional in intercultural communication. And there were so many other stories of people who reminded me so much of my own background and of the background I'm sure of so many of you here, and that is people who, like us, are Americans who have pride in their faith, pride in their heritage, who share the American dream and who want to succeed, and who value the values of America. Uh, it is an American story. It's a community not unlike other communities. And it's interesting because the anecdotes tell that story, but our polling does as well. We've polled, as I said, not only um, Arab and Muslim Americans, but we've polled ethnic Americans. We've polled Irish and Italian and Polish, and we put together a book I did a few years back called Ethnic Americans, What They Really Think. And, and what we learned about Muslims then was really quite fascinating. First of all, the, the diversity of the community is extraordinary. Probably the single largest group is African American. After that, you have Arab American and, and South Asian American, but growing numbers of Iranian Americans and Turkish Americans and, and folks from African countries who, again, each one of them as you meet them in their communities or on their own remind you of the immigrant story of every other group that's come to America in terms of their values, in terms of their aspirations, in terms of the fact that you get into the cab and you talk to the guy and he's doing his day job but he's got a night job and he's got three kids and he'll tell you with enormous pride of what they're doing in college. It's the American story. And like I said, that comes through in the polling that we've done. What we learn is, for example, that the values of Muslims in America track closely the values of other ethnic Americans, in particular Catholics. Like Catholics, they lean progressive on a number of fiscal issues, like, for example, supporting health care or strengthening social security or school funding or funding to clean the environment, but then they lean conservative on social issues like family values or abortion or tough on crime or, and this might be interesting to you, tough on laws that would fight terrorism. The income of Muslim Americans is slightly higher than the average, the national average. And mosque attendance is actually about the same as church attendance. And the values of those who are regular mosque attendees track closely with those who are regular church attendees and those who aren't track closely with those who aren't regular church attendees. And the belief, as I said, in the American dream is the same. This is what we know. And this is the story that we told after 9-11 and it's the story that we tell again today. President Bush got it completely right. The problem is not Islam. The problem are people who have used Islam to commit violent acts against our country and our people. But what happened after 9-11 when we were all asking these questions is that a cottage industry of those who actually had an axe to grind against the religion of Islam and against Muslims and against Arabs, I believe in particular, they ended up providing most of the answers. They wrote books and got them published. They testified before Congress and they dominated the airwaves on radio and on television. I'll never forget a hearing that was held in the Senate on Islam featuring three guys who, actually if you had the reverse and the three Muslims were testifying on the nature of Judaism in an Arab country, you'd hear whoops and yells. But it was acceptable for this to happen. And the lies they told and the bigotry that they spread was horrific. And yet, people were just nodding in the audience because that's all they heard. That's all actually they were in a position to hear. These guys conflated every incident of violence as somehow evidence that they were right. And they've done enormous damage. Shortly after 9-11, when we polled overall America, what we found is that people still had a very favorable attitude toward Islam. And today when we poll, they do not. Back then when we polled, three quarters of Americans said they felt they needed to know more. 
and they wanted to know more about Islam and about Muslims. And today, less than half say they need to know more. The fact is, is that unfavorable views have risen, but bad information has increased as well so that people think they know. And that's the dangerous thing. I mean, ignorance and certitude are probably the most dangerous combination of all. I mean, you talked about Sharia and, uh, and, and I mean, we went into Iraq not having a clue, and yet a month later, people were talking about Sunnis and Shia as if they actually knew what the difference was, and madrasas and Wahhabis and Salafi. And if you would, could put two words in a sentence, you became an expert and you got on television to talk about it. If this weren't enough, this cast of characters organized not only information campaigns, but they actually organized politically. They were the ones who stopped the Khalil Gibran Academy in New York City. And they were the ones now, the very same cast of characters who are organizing against Park 51. This is a danger. As Salam correctly pointed out, it is a danger to the image of our country abroad. It flies in the face of the wise counsel offered by George W. Bush. It's a danger to our values, but it is also a danger to the very social fabric of who we are as a country. A few years back, I was invited to speak in Warsaw and in Prague and other places in Europe to talk about the difference. People wanted to know, what's the difference between America and, and Europe? And why are your Muslim and Arab communities not alienated? Why have they risen to the top in your countries in ways that they have not done so here? I began, and I spoke about the fact that we as a nation have always been different. We've been different in the sense that America as a concept is different, and America as a reality is different. No ethnic group defines who we are. No religion defines who we are. Bigots have had their way over time, but in the end, ultimately, the notion of America as an absorptive entity that transforms people into America. You don't just get a passport here. You get an identity as a new person. It's an alchemy that transforms you into becoming American. You can be a Kurd in Germany for three generations, and you'll always be a Turk. You can be an Algerian in France for three generations, and you'll always be an Arab. Or you can be Pakistani in London, and you'll always be a Paki. You can get citizenship, it's an effort, but you never get the nationality. You never get that sense that I'm part of this people. The narrative doesn't include you. I, as a kid, when we studied Lewis and Clark, I went with them. When Washington crossed the Delaware, I was on the boat. I mean, there was the sense you had that it was your story. It wasn't somebody else's story. That's who we are as a country. And what troubles me is that what is at stake in this Park 51 story is not about a building, and it's not about a place. It is about the narrative of who we are as a people. And if these guys win, whatever the outcome, but if these guys win, then America won't be America anymore. And the story of the Muslim community here may very well be like that of the Muslim community in France or in Germany. And that would be devastating for the social fabric of our country. And I will leave it there and I thank you. And I hope we don't have to have this discussion again in this way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zogby. Uh, I know we have a lot of questions. And before we get to the questions, uh, just a couple ground rules. First, make sure it's a question and not a speech. Um, you want to make a speech, you can do your own panel. Um, <laughs> and then, um, for, uh, out of respect for our friends from C-SPAN, they have a boom mic, um, so they're going to come around. I know you guys are kind of crammed in here, so they'll come around and make their best effort to get the mic above you so that you can have your question heard to the rest of the country. Let me start off with a quick question, and kind of picking up on what Dr. Zogby talked about. And I've been getting this question quite a bit, both from friends and um, in the media, and that is, Post 9-11, we, we suffered this hor horrendous, tragic attack, but the country seemed to pull together. And while there were incidents of retaliation and uh, some incidents not only against Muslim Americans, but people perceived to be Muslim American, why is this coming up now, eight, nine years later? Why is there now a call to stop the construction of mosques across the country? 
There are over 2,000 plus mosques in the country. The population has grown. There's over six to eight million Muslims in the country. Why is this coming to a head now? If you want to answer that, Jim or Salam. Look, there is a. There is a general mood afoot in the country. It is part and parcel of the broader social unraveling, I think, that is taking place. Um, we had, we saw it begin last summer. Um, I think some of it has to do with the fact that we have elected an African-American president and some folks just can't ingest it. There's no question, I think, that the economic distress and the social dislocation that has occurred is part of it. Um, and I think at the same time th that eight or nine years of um, disinformation has taken a toll. But if the, con if the social conditions weren't there, if this unraveling wasn't there, uh, I don't think we'd see it uh, in, this, in exactly the same way. It is classic uh, xenophobic nativism. Uh, we've seen it, as speakers mentioned in our history before. I mean, we had the anti-Asian uh, backlash in the, in the early part of the last century. Um, shortly after world, between the two wars, we had the, um, uh, an, an anti-Southern European, I mean, Italians got lynched and there was a, a push to deny immigration. Actually, our folks and most of the Southern Europeans were called trash and got zeroed out because they were anarchist, socialist, whatever, threats to America. And so we, we had the same kind of thing. And then we had the anti-German uh, wave as well. So in periods of economic stress, this begins to happen. Uh, it has been fueled, I think, by, by bigotry and ignorance. But um, another factor is, is that the president himself is in a bind. I mean, it, George Bush was able to come and speak out. Uh, if Barack Obama comes and speaks out as forcefully, you've got 20% of the public thinks he's Muslim already and holds that against them. And so in some ways, he's in a bind. It puts the rest of the, the, the country in a bind in that where, where does leadership come from on this uh, and how can leadership speak forcefully about it? I think it's a terrible situation and we do need uh, political leadership instead of fanning the flames as some are doing. We need political leadership to do uh, uh, the right thing and, and put this out because as I said, I think that the, the very social fabric of the country is at stake here. Do you want to add anything? Well, I, you know, I think I, I agree with everything uh, Jim, Jim has said. And uh, I think we're at a crossroads in our society uh, in terms of what, how we define America. Is, is America an exclusive club? Or are we going to live up to, the stand, to our values of pluralism? And when people start questioning the Christianity of our president, uh, I, I think that's a form of religious nationalism. I think they're using religion to say even religion now within America is part of an exclusive club. Uh, and so this exploitation of the truth that is used, is used also for political purposes since this is now an election year uh, coming up to the November elections. And the fact is Muslims... They're an easy punching bag uh, for this uh, because we don't have the reach, we don't have a lobby, we don't have um, a PR um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, and so while we are responding to, to everything, the other side obviously has the microphone. It's the other side of extremists. And my mentor uh, always said something that is very telling for us as Muslims, for us as Americans, for us as people. He said, the world is not divided into Muslims, Christians, and Jews. The world is divided into stupid people and intelligent people. Well, on that note, who wants to be the first to ask an intelligent <laughs> question? <laughs> Raise your hand and we'll have the gentleman with the mic come over. It's right behind you, Mike Shorts. Suhail, you and I have discussed this in the past, and that is that while 
We know that the great majority of Muslims embrace and, uh, and endorse the founding principles of the United States and want to be good Americans. Unfortunately, there are people who, uh, who, uh, who don't, the Nidal Hassans of the world, and who profess to be acting in the name of Islam. And one of the difficulties, it seems to me, is there's no central authority, there's no central definition of what a good Muslim is. Is there any effort uh, to, within the Muslim American community to, uh, uh, to, to uphold uh, an America affirming Islam and, and reject and marginalize those people who want to kidnap Islam. Thanks, Mike. Professor? Uh, I, think this, uh, I think this call for a centralized uh, figure in American Islam to tell people what Islam is, what's right and wrong, is uh, misguided. Uh, we do not have a pope, and we're not going to elect one for the United States. Um, we believe in democracy. We believe in structures where people even within Islam and not just outside it would hold to different interpretations of Islam so long as they are consistent within, uh, with the basic principles of the Quran. What we really need is a council of scholars, not people who call themselves scholars, spe especially not patriarchal scholars. Um, People who really understand what Islamic law is about, have studied it, can, can think about it and write about it, who will come together and evaluate the various trends in the United States and uh, Muslim trends and comment uh, on them in writing. That's why I was calling for an education. Uh, I would like it, for example, uh, recently a lot of people came to me and said, uh, you know, what about this story of the stoning uh, in Afghanistan? You know, uh, isn't that applying Sharia law? And I thought, oh my God, if that was applying Sharia law. And so we sat at my organization, Karama, and we wrote a multi-page uh, analysis of that in which we showed that, first of all, it's not application of Sharia law, and second of all, that the people who committed that act are themselves punishable because they killed innocent victims. You know, nobody is talking about that. So what we really need is not central authority. I, as a woman who believes in democracy, will move away from central authority, but ask for order and ask for responsibility and for uh, legal authority in the sense of understanding the religion to educate Muslims as well as non-Muslims in the U.S. I'd like to just add to that. It's not just the issue of what scholars are saying, but it's also what people are doing on the ground. I think the, the strongest front line against any kind of alienation or isolation of young Muslim Americans, that the work is being done in mosques, in youth associations, in community centers. Uh, it's people that promote civic engagement. It's people who promote the principles of Islam. And for example, there is no stoning in the Quran. And yet that, that myth continues to be repeated uh, that we have to respond to, unfortunately, over and over again. I just want to say as far as Sharia, it's, it's the, as we said, the path to God and the principles of Sharia are mercy, justice, and human dignity. The goals of Sharia are five that are accepted by all the scholars with unanimity. They are the rights to life, free expression, faith, family, and property. So if there's any violation of those goals, then it is a violation of Sharia. So that common understanding among the common Muslim is really the goal that our organization and other Muslim American organizations are pursuing. Jim? Take another... Um another cut at that in a, in a different way. Um, I, the, I'm a Catholic. Um, all priests are not pedophiles. Um, I work with Italians. Um, they're not all tied in with the mob. Um, I'm married to an Irish woman. She doesn't drink. Um, the, the, I, I remember saying after the Christmas Day um, attempt to blow up that plane in Detroit that we learned from that that we didn't connect the dots in our intelligence community correctly. As dangerous as not correct connecting the dots is to wrongly connect dots and think you've come up with a picture. And I think one of the problems that we've got is that, as I said in, in my remarks, they conflated every single incident that has occurred and drawn a portrait of Islam. 
Um, I, I, some have chastised me for using the word bigotry. But, but let's understand what, what, what it is. I mean, bigotry is when you take the characteristics of a few and generalize them into the behavior or, or, or attribute that then to the whole. So this priest, that priest, that priest. Actually, unfortunately, the only stories we ever read about priests these days are that. But the, the Salam story of the good, hardworking Muslims all over. And yet we know in our own heart of hearts and in our own experience that the problem is we don't know Muslims well enough yet. And so uh, Aziza's point that we na need to have this intelligent conversation, we need more exposure, we need to know more about it, we need to retain what we know, um, and we need not to connect the dots in a way that is not warranted. And so I, I think that more than a religious authority, there's more experience and a change of heart. Uh, and, and that would, I think, be helpful in dealing with this problem more than, if you had the, the, the Muslim Pope say, he is not a Muslim for what he did, you would still have people saying, he's not authentic, he's not speaking for it, Nidal Hassan is. You know? And I think that that's the problem that we have to contend with. I remember speaking one time in New York at a, 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 the first anniversary of 9-11. Uh, Tom Brokaw invited me to come and speak in the round to families of survivors. And it was a very painful day for them, and it was a difficult experience for me. First question was, why did they do it? What, 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 what justified it? I said, nothing justified it, period. Absolutely nothing justified it. Next question, why do you say nothing justified it and then say, but? I said, I didn't say but. I said, nothing justified it. When are you people going to stop trying to find justification? Now, I understood their pain. I understood that their pain had temporarily closed their ears to listening. But the reality is, is that from the, the rest of America, we didn't have that direct pain, and yet too many still closed their ears and made the judgment that all Muslims thought this way or all Muslims thought that way or all Muslims are inclined to violence and that you need to have Muslims speak out, and yet when Salam's group spoke out and other groups spoke out and repeatedly spoke out, nobody heard them. So, uh, yeah. yeah, responsible Muslims. Yeah, uh, they, they, you know, we need a Thank mechanism you. by yeah. which they can be heard. Professor, you had a comment. I just wanted to point out that while we're having this wonderful discussion, we don't even know yet what is, or we don't agree, what is the definition of Sharia law. Keep that in the back of your <laughs> mind. Next question. In the front here. Yeah, hi. Um, what role do you think the press plays in showing the Muslims in a negative light versus the positive light that it's already in, um, in terms of stoking you know, prejudice and stereotype and Islamophobia. Um, I work in the Middle East peace movement with a group of Muslims, Arabs, Jews, Christians. And what I found out is there's interfaith, multicultural Middle East peace movements, not just in Northern Virginia and DC, they're in every city across the country. They're in Israel and Palestine, they're in Jerusalem. No mention of these um, organizations in the national media. So the question is, why do you think that's so if it is so, and then how can we change that so? For example, I'm Jewish, but I'm not a billionaire. But if you look at the press, all, all Jewish people, are, we're all rich. And this stereotyping goes on with African Americans, with, uh, with lots of different minorities. But how do we change these images so that America changes as the images change? Well, just two points on that. Just wanted to quick, uh, speak to two uh, issues. Number one, the nature of the media is they only cover what's a conflict. So moderation uh, and bridge building is not newsworthy. It, it doesn't make the news when we get 10,000 people in Chicago at our annual convention, for example, or in Los Angeles, and we bring government and uh, all sorts of uh, uh, civic leaders, and we talk about how we as Americans of all different faith backgrounds are working together for justice, uh, are working together, together against any kind of extremism, uh, are working together for peace uh, and security for the people in the Middle East. It just doesn't make news. Um, so unless there is a conflict, and usually the story, if you look at the stories about Muslims, it's usually about their religious holidays. So okay, they're having their religious holidays. Or it's an issue where 
there is a discrimination story uh, about a woman who wears a headscarf or a man who wants to wear his beard. Um, and that, you know, in and of itself is reductive in terms of what the Muslim American com community is all about. When it comes to the headscarf, you know, I'm, I, I know it's become very politicized, especially in the Middle East, and now it's becoming politicized here in America. It, you know, the, the headscarf has become a political football. Number one, a woman who decides to, to wear the headscarf is not oppressed. She's liberated in her own mind. It's her choice. So when it comes to the headscarf, we should not be imposing women how to, how to dress, and we should not be telling them that they have to take it off. We should be pro-choice uh, on that issue. Uh, and, and the other issues of discrimination, it just looks like Muslims are just concerned about entitlement. Now, the second problem, though, for, for us as Muslims, what is our responsibility, is that I don't think that we have effectively answered the questions that our fellow Americans have had. Uh, about Islam. Now, we tend to just talk about worship, but they want to know what is our social interaction, what is our role in, in our pluralism. You know, in 1988, we had about, what, about 100 people, Muslims, Christians, uh, Arabs, and non-Arabs, go to the Democratic National Convention. We felt that we were part of that American uh, experience. We felt that we were contributing in terms of the policy discussions, in terms of our interaction. Uh, now we find less people uh, attending those conventions, unfortunately, within the Muslim American community. There needs to be more civic engagement. And, and with that, I think more stories can be told about the Muslim American community. And again, it's not about the scholars necessarily. It's about the mainstream voice. What is that mainstream voice? And we still haven't understood what that mainstream voice is. Next question. Go here, and then here, and then here. Back here. Um, yeah. You spoke, Dr. Zogby, you spoke a lot about people who were Need putting... To the mic. Yeah. You spoke a lot about people who were putting misinformation into the mainstream and people who were spreading hate, and I was wondering if you could give some names or some organizations that we should be aware of um, in the media and who have been publishing books. I, I, um, uh, I think that they're... We can talk later. Their websites are, are known. Um, and they have uh, been uh, tormenting many of us for years. I had the, the great honor of speaking at the 45th anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights Building. The Department of Justice invited me to give the closing remarks. Um, the next day, an article appeared, uh, Holder's Hezbollah buddy. Really tough for a Maronite to be a Hezbollah buddy <laughs> but of anybody. Uh, a couple of weeks later, I was invited to speak at the Iftar at the Pentagon. Uh, yes, there's an Iftar dinner at the Pentagon, sponsored by the Muslims in the military. A um, couple days later, an article appeared about Zagbi, the Wahhabi, to be Wahhabi and Hezbollah and Maronite Christian. It's really a rough uh, game. But um, th these characters are, are, are all over the place. And uh, it, frankly, what troubles me is not only their websites, uh, which taunt college professors and urge students to spy on them and, and create disinformation campaigns about not just Muslim, but, but in particular Arab American leadership. Uh, what, what troubles me is the degree to which they end up dominating on Fox News and on MSNBC and CNN when it comes time to talking about these issues. Um, <laughs> Actually, we don't get the airtime to talk about them. Uh, they do. And if we get invited, uh, we get invited to debate them. And frankly, I don't want to engage in a debate uh, with th these, these guys. And so it, it, does become, uh, it does become a bit of a problem. Uh, and I, I think that uh, uh, the, where the media has a responsibility is uh, to fatten their Rolodexes a little bit and, uh, and be more responsible. But at, it's not just that we're, we, we go, we're invited to go and debate them. We're invited to go and deny the accusations. Yeah. So it's really uh, uh, the cards are stacked against us. And, you're, you know, then you just look like you're in denial. And it goes back to the media question. How come the message is not getting out? Because the only time you're invited is to say, okay, we're not terrorists, we're not extremists. And so that's all people think about. Uh, so... Um, that's one thing. And number two, we were also called uh, part of the Wahhabi lobby. Uh, number one, we're not lobbying. 
uh, anything. We're, we're just here to educate people about who we are and what we represent. Number two, um, our organization from its beginning has stated clearly that we don't accept any foreign funding. Not because it's, you know, it's an issue of legality, it's perfectly legal, but we have decided that we wanted to stress the Muslim American identity. So we wanted to be financially and philosophically independent from the Middle East. And yet somebody continues to call us part of the Wahhabi lobby and obviously we don't subscribe to that thinking. And it gets repeated enough times that that's all that, that is on people's minds. One, one last point on, on the, just uh, from, from, I'm sorry, I just want to make one point. I got my doctorate in religion, and then I did my postdoctoral work in how religion is used in, in societies under stress. And, 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 and one of the, the things that you, remember George Carlin had a routine where he, he talked about words and how they were used? Basically, it was an interesting lesson because it was the lesson of, of, of Wittgenstein. The meaning of a word is how it's used in a sentence. Well, the meaning of how religion is how it's used too. And the point is, is that today, the language of Islam used by both this cast of characters we're talking about, but also the terrorists, are identical in that they're, they're abusing language because of its evocative content. So the, the guy who gets up on the plane and says Allah or whatever and then th blows the plane up is not making a statement about his faith. What he's really doing is making a statement saying, I really hate you guys, or I'm really angry, or I'm really upset, or it might be I'm, I'm mad at my dad. I mean, we could psychoanalyze what he's doing. But similarly, the guys who throw Wahhabi or, I mean, I, I remember on the playground, people calling me names. I mean, that, they're, they're calling names, and the name they choose to call is the name that has the most evocative reference. There was a time when I might have been called a Marxist, socialist, communist. Now I'm called a Wahhabi Hezbollah. Basically, it's a way of taunting because the word has evocative content. Um, is, somebody says, Jesus Christ. They're not making a statement of faith. They're saying, I'm really mad right now. And that's the same thing that's going on here on both sides of this. And so I, I think we need to understand the use and abuse of language in this, car, in this context and understand that these guys who are throwing these names about calling him Wahhabi or me, Hezbollah, the truth value of it means nothing. They're not concerned with that. They're looking in their dictionary of like, what's the worst word I can use right now? And I think I'll call him this. That'll work. Well, let me just say again that there's nothing new about this, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I meet new friends also every day and new arguments. <laughs> but uh, Jefferson, believe it or not, worried about this in his own days, that the media might be taking control and you know, influencing the thinking of the community so that uh, it would have more power than it should in a democracy. This is a problem that America has that it needs to solve, not only with respect to Muslims, but with respect to media in general. But as far as a Muslim, uh, my approach is that instead of complaining you know, about it, which is, you know, we've done enough of that, let's look for a solution. And the solution for me is to start it. Uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, Muslim doctors in this country. There are a lot of Muslim uh, business people in this country. But Muslims in the past shrank away from being lawyers, from being reporters, uh, and so on. And now there is a generation of Muslim, young Muslim lawyers that I'm very happy to see around the country. And where are the communication people? If you want your own authentic voice to be heard, where are you? And if you are sitting in a paper and somebody hears your objection to the news they're just about to publish, maybe you'll be able to modify that view. So my, my approach to this is that, OK, we know the problems. Let's now move in and do our part in correcting it. There's a question here. Right, right here. So um, you've already referred to um, the, I guess, like media appeal of moderation or of interfaith work and how that kind of doesn't necessarily play. And, you know, with psychological research that says that when you respond to somebody's argument, you almost um, solidify it in the, opinions, uh, in the opinions of the listener or the viewer. Um, so what are we supposed to do if we can't refute their arguments, when we can't sell our moderation, when we can't sell our identities? Uh, what, what, what are Muslim Americans supposed to do? Well, number one, we, we feel that, you know, there's a verse in the Quran that says, 
when it refers to hate, says the rhetoric of hate is like the scum on top of water, it will float away. But the good work that you do that is of substance will remain on earth, that will benefit humanity. So it just tells you, number one, ignore all the rhetoric, ignore all the noise, it will always happen. It's been happening uh, from the beginning and it continues to this day. So the good work, even though it's not sensational, even though it's not going to get the, the, the media today, it, the relationships that we are building is, is creating energy, it is creating a movement for change. Because the, the people that we get to know, the Jim Zogbys, the Azizas, uh, the, the Reverend um, uh, Ed Bacon, uh, Rabbi Leonard Bierman, uh, these are great people. Uh, Jeremy Benami of J Street, uh, these are great Americans. And so we feel that that story of what we represent as, as an American group of people working for peace and justice will prevail eventually. Then in terms of being more media savvy, uh, what we have, for example, we have a, a, a PSA, public service announcement, that went out uh, on the, onto the internet. And it got a lot of play. Um, it got into the media. So it was called Injustice Cannot Defeat Injustice. And it was basically a group of Muslim scholars, by the way, in answering that first question, talking to young people and saying, don't be fooled by the extremist rhetoric. So those efforts are getting significant media coverage, but as we know in, media, in any media, it's only, um, it's only within people's memory in a short span. The next week is a whole new story. So you have to keep thinking about telling that story over and over again. Um, and, and so we're going to be doing uh, some 9-11 service activities, for example. There'll be you know, health clinics in all the mosques uh, on the day of 9-11. There'll be the commemor commemoration of the victims of 9-11. And it is just a shame that you know, part of the industry that Jim was referring to is trying to divide the victims of 9-11 as if Muslims were not uh, uh, victimized along with other Americans that day. You know, people of all ethnicities, of all backgrounds, were in the World Trade Center towers, were attacked. We were all attacked as Americans. So telling that story uh, is important, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be having a, a commemoration and vigils on that day. And that will get some coverage, but uh, you'll, you'll have to continue working at that. The, the third thing is, now that we have social media, uh, we really are creating our own movement in the sense that the word is getting out through Facebook and Twitter and, and other means of social media. So that will get the interest of the networks at some point. And, and I think there is, there's mon much hope because we really have a lot of opportunity in getting the word out. Let me also add that not all the ways in which you respond uh, to the situation are necessarily glitzy. Some of it has to be really hard, patient work over time. That is the work of scholars because a lot of Muslims, when you tell them Islam says X and they don't know that, they'll say prove it. And that's where you can then pull an article like off our website and say, look at it. But we have to be prepared because these articles you cannot whip out of thin air. You have to take you know, a long time uh, studying them and analyzing them and footnoting them, which sounds very academic. But believe it or not, I was in, in one country where they had a law which I thought was unfair to women, and I was arguing that they need to change it. And the legislator looked at me and said, when, after I expressed what I think is the correct position in, of Islam on the matter, he said, show me the footnotes. That's what he asked for. So yes, scholarly work is very important, and so is grassroots backed up by that work. Talib? I'd like to first of all say that I'm grateful for this conversation. And I'm, uh, I'm proud to be a Muslim. Um, I'm proud to be African American, as you can probably tell. And uh, I'm also a veteran, as well as um, a uh, health care and disabilities uh, attorney. And it just always uh, surprises me. And you asked, um, and, and whether or not, I, I'm asking you, do you think that maybe we could change the narrative by making sure that um, our spokespeople uh, are also representative of the full diversity of the Muslim community? Uh, there are many other uh, African Americans, even Latino and, his, uh, and European Americans who, as you know, are the r most uh, increasing uh, population of Muslims in this country, uh, who are more than committed to, to be involved in this conversation. So that's my first question. And then my second question is, um, 
don't you believe that we should take, um, you know, the, the history note from the African American experience in particular and see, for example, when we had the, um, the reconstruction of the United States uh, after the Civil War, that there was a rise in, in uh, an anti-African uh, American sentiment uh, that basically resulted in lynching and all types of horrible actions across this country. And so do we not see the same parallel? I mean, just some months ago, all attention was on Arizona and the, uh, the laws there to demonize Latinos. And, uh, and not so long ago, it was on an, another group of uh, Americans. And so don't we think that you know, groups such as the Koch brothers, who are funding some of these things, uh, we, as we read in the New Yorker magazine, uh, some of this anti-Islamic rhetoric, don't, don't we see that there are really entrenched interests, as was said uh, right, earlier, being financial and others, <laughs> to, to really get guys behind this? Let me Absolutely. just just adjust your terminology a little bit, uh, as opposed to seeing a parallel. The way we see it, and we teach it in my organization, is that there is a continuity from the early days till now, because a lot of these African Americans were Muslims. And we believe that American Muslims from the 16th uh, century and, and later have helped build this country. We, we are not new immigrants, because if you speak about new immigrants, you're forgetting the other wing of uh, Muslims who are the natives in this country. So not only uh, do we see a continuity, but that experience you're referring to is also our experience. The question is how much within the Muslim community we identify with each other. How do we deal with the question of diversity within the Muslim community? And I think that has become a more conscious question more recently, and we are trying to deal with it. Could I just stress uh, one point, answering your question in terms of diversity? I think the more we stress the Muslim American identity, then the more we will naturally have diversity in our representation in our events, in our uh, presentations, in telling our story. So yes, I agree with you, we can do more in terms of having that diversity. And there are problems that we're dealing with internally uh, in terms of that, that issue. Where are we in terms of the civil rights progression? Um, I think we're still in the very early stages of that. We are not at the time of Martin Luther King, for Muslim Americans in general, all of Muslim Americans. Definitely African American Muslims have, can contribute very positively to understanding where we should be in terms of getting our rights in, in American society. But I think as a Muslim American community, we're still in the thought stages. We're still in the stages of Marcus Garvey, for example, or W.E.V. Du Bois, or people that are developing the ideas for the Muslim American community. Um, and, and defining home as not where our ancestors came from, not where my grandparents lived, but where my grandchildren are going to be raised. I think that, in terms of the Muslim American identity, no matter what, where, what background we're from, is very important. And lastly, God wants us all to be thinking leaders, not blind followers. I think that's the message that's very important that we have to stress for the thinking Muslim, the common Muslim. All right, we've got about 10 minutes, so I'm going to ask for really quick questions and then quicker answers. Um, go right here and then over here, and we'll kind of go back and forth. Thank you. Uh, I was interested, I, I guess I have two questions. The first would be, what contemporary Muslim country, which operates under Sharia right now, would you point to as an example of the benign Sharia that was described here today? And the second part was, which moderate Muslim groups uh, spoke out uh, when the, it was discovered that texts at the Islamic Saudi Academy in Northern Virginia we're talking about murdering Christians and Jews. Which were the specific people, of the specific moderate Muslims, who spoke out against that when the International Commission on Religious Freedom reported that? Okay. Thank you. Do you want to? I'd like to answer the first question uh, because it's very simple. Uh, our belief is that there is no Muslim country now that is following uh, Sharia law, and one good reason is because the very basics of the Islamic society, including uh, the election of the head of state legitimately by the people, is not taking place. Um, where do you go from there? So I'm not standing here to defend any Muslim country. And I hope 
that within the United States I can be a better Muslim than I can in some of these Muslim countries. You called it benign Sharia law. It's like, you know, what did we do to it or for it to make it benign? Uh, I don't like that terminology. Our laws are humanitarian laws, equitable laws, etc. There is no attempt to make them more or less benign. The only issue is whether they are applied or not applied. And in fact, there is no Muslim country that applies it. There are tons of Muslim countries that claim that they are applying it. And they're using this to oppress their people. They're trying to tell the people that they're there and their laws are by divine will, so to speak. Uh, and we need to tell these people that this is not true. And divine will would want the will of the people to speak out. Condemnations? Oh, you know, it goes back to the question, you know, do you want to validate the accusation that Muslims don't speak out? And, and the fact is, we have spoken out at every instance. Um, and it gets ridiculous how many times things keep coming up uh, to the point that we don't even know uh, the cases that come up, whether they are actually valid or not. And the commission that the gentleman uh, refers to, some of the commission leaders uh, have questionable um, uh, views uh, in terms of religious freedom of Muslims in America. Uh, there was a report on that. So I don't want to get into the politics of that commission or the politics of that, that academy, but when it comes to um, anyone saying that, that, that we should be murdering Christians and, and Jews, we condemn that um, and we denounce any groups that uh, espouse those beliefs. Jim? This is one of those, uh, if I can quote the the New Testament, uh, those who have eyes to see and ears to hear uh, stories. I, um, I condemned it. I'm not Muslim. I'm Christian. I run the Arab American Institute. I was actually on Crossfire when that story first came out. I was asked about it, and I said it's gross, despicable, and wrong. Should should be stopped. Went a couple of years later. I was invited to Saudi Arabia to uh, by the U.S. Ambassador, Bob Jordan at the time, who had not been able to have a guest or a visitor to the country in a period of time, long time, um, and wanted me to come and do a luncheon at the embassy and, and invite a number of Saudi uh, business leaders. And then he wanted me to speak to a number of groups around town. One of the groups he invited me to speak to was a group called Whammy, um, and it involves a lot of young Muslim leaders uh, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, the ambassador took me to the event, sat with me at the event. Uh, I was introduced, I spoke and then they drove me back to the embassy when it was over. I got a question about uh, Pat Robertson and, and some other U.S. preachers preaching uh, hate uh, about Islam. And I said, uh, condemn it. And we work real hard every day to fight these guys. And we're working harder than you can imagine to deal with this bigotry uh, in America. I said, but let me remind you uh, that you have imams in this country who are saying things about Jews and Christians that are deplorable. Are you fighting them? Um, and uh, they all nodded guilty and whatever, and we had a conversation about it. Uh, a week later, I get back into the country, and one of these characters that I mentioned a moment ago writes an article about Zogby, supporter of Wahhabism, speaks at whammy. Um, <laughs> Didn't pay attention to the fact the ambassador invited me. Didn't know what I'd said uh, and actually had become an article in the newspaper that I challenged them on the bigotry of some imams. Uh, the point is, is that uh, a lot of groups condemned that book when it was first released. And the Saudis did the job of getting rid of the book. It shouldn't have been there in the first place. Um, pay attention to what is done, what is said. And, and I think we'd, we'd do a lot better in this conversation if we, if we did just that. Question over here. Um, I'm going to add another term for you guys, which is moderate or modern Muslims, which I, as a Muslim, have trouble with, as if we have to add a word first before just saying Muslims in this country. And I would like your input on this, because unless you're not wearing a headscarf or unless you don't go to mosque that, or unless you look cool, then you're a moderate Muslim. But if you're wearing a hijab, or you go to the mosque, or you're a practicing Muslim, then you don't qualify for that term. And the trouble with that is that we've seen some people in leadership position advocating that 
those are the people that we need to talk to, regardless if they were non-practicing Muslims or, you know, not cool-looking Muslims. So I'd like to just hear your... Well, I'd like to approach this uh, label of modern Muslim in a different way, because I know my colleagues here will address your answer more to the point. But in Islam, there is nothing wrong with saying that somebody has uh, interpreted Islam in accordance with the society they live in. In fact, it is a required effort that Muslim scholars when they live in a society, say American or Euro European or Iraqi or whatever, that they look into the circumstances of their society and then explain the rules and, and, basic, you know, and the basic principles don't change, but the rules and the secondary laws in light of that society so that when they are used and applied, they cause positive results and not negative ones. Because the general rule in Islam is that God, the lawmaker, made these laws in public interest and not against the public interest. So yes, there are scholars here, including myself, who are looking at the American society and who are trying to understand Islamic laws within the context of our society. And that is very traditional approach and accepted approach for what we do. What you're talking about is something more political, uh, and I will let the others answer. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, first of all, the Quran says that it is God's will that you be a community of the middle way uh, of moderation. And that's directly out of the Quran. And the prophet also warned against any kind of extremism to the left or to the right, to stay in, in that middle way. So within our religion, of course, it promotes moderate thinking, progressive thinking. And it is a responsibility of Muslims now to apply that in whatever place and time they live in. Now, I agree with uh, Aziza that the, the term moderate Muslim has been highly politicized so that now moderate simply means a person who agrees with the status quo. So, you know, all Muslims are bad, yeah, all Muslims are bad. Islam is evil, yeah, Islam is evil, and then that is the moderate Muslim. So that the only people who are the moderate spokespeople are people who have left Islam. Uh, and there's a paradox in that, it's ridiculous that these, uh, these are people that are now the moderates, like Ayan Hershey Ali, who's not a Muslim herself, but she is, you know, given the book tours and speaking everywhere. Uh, or people who support policies uh, of certain industries. So they support war, okay, that's a moderate Muslim. They support the policies of the state of Israel against Palestinians, then that's a moderate Muslim. So because that term has been uh, politicized and exploited, then that term moderate now doesn't really mean anything in our community, and I agree with you. It's, it's Muslim or mainstream Muslim. To be a Muslim means you're adhering to the principles of Islam. Uh, to promote uh, terrorism means you're a criminal. It's not even a question of whether you're a Muslim or not. Question here? Alongside with an increase in civic and political engagement from the Muslim American community, what should we expect from our elected officials? Like, what role should they play in this atmosphere of Islamophobia? They really should uh, stick to the values of the Constitution and <laughs> create harmony among the people and protect their rights. And and they should be responsible, and they are irresponsible these days. Uh, the way, uh, I, I, the, the Park 51 dispute, to the degree that it was a, um, a Manhattan fight, we'd seen it before over the Khalil Gibran Academy, which is a terrible loss, actually, that that school got gutted the way it did. Um, it, nevertheless, it was that same cast of characters sort of playing this out, and then you know, some national political figures got into the mix and decided to exploit it. And then one by one, you had it becoming an issue. I mean, I got, you know, you have candidates in states where there are basically almost no Muslims being asked, what's your position on the mosque? And, and, and then taking positions, well, it's uh, not a bad, you yeah, got the right to build them, but I don't think they ought to be building it there. And um, or uh, what are they doing it? They're defaming sallow, uh, hollowed ground or what? You know, it, it just it became an issue that had nothing to do with, you know, states and 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 cities and congressional districts across the country. Politicians behaved irresponsibly, and what should have happened, on the part of media, on the part of higher political leadership, is that we should have called them out early on. 
and said, you are being irresponsible. I mean, what we learned after 9-11 was that the measure of our patriotism was the degree to which we were true to the values of our country and that we would, as we said, it became a cliche, we weren't going to let the terrorists win. Tragically, I'm reading the signs from those marches in New York. I'm listening to the rhetoric I'm hearing on some of the television and radio shows. I'm listening to what some of the political leaders, including presidential aspirants, are saying. And the terrorists won. They're winning this fight. And we're sounding in our country no better than extremists abroad. And the clash of civilization crowd on both sides are driving this debate. It is irresponsible. It is a shame. George Bush was right. And it is hurting our country, our image abroad, and it is hurting the very social fabric of who we are as a people. I think you might uh, agree with a very short sentence I will tell you, which does not relate only to issues of Muslims. But what I'd like to see is for politicians to put the interest of the country ahead of political interests. And that will serve us quite a lot. On that note, that had to be the last question. We're out of time. So I want to ask uh, Asad Akhtar to close us out. Thank you so much, Suhail, and thank you all for being here. It's a, it's a problem of our briefings. We always run out of time, these great discussions, and we always never have enough space. But I was just you know, thinking with our panelists speaking that you know, the whole time is only in America. You know, we, we have a public hearing room. Anyone can walk in. You know, this building, we always say, the staffers always complain that you, know, you don't need an appointment. You can just walk around the halls if you want to. And uh, you know, we're on C-SPAN having a discussion about faith. C-SPAN, an entity de you know, dedicated to a public discussion for the American people. You know, we're all blessed to be Americans and to be able to have this discussion. And we hope to have many more in the future. Uh, let me thank our panelists. Our moderator, Suhail Khan, who was kind of the brainchild behind all this and pulled together kind of in four days, but we needed to have it. Uh, let me just introduce uh, some of the executive board of the Congressional Muslim Staff Association. Uh, we have our vice president, Mamoun Safab, our communications director, Moaz Mustafa, both on the Senate side, and uh, our uh, programs coordinator, Mr. Jay Saleh Williams. Um, I want to thank uh, the House Science Committee for giving us this room and for Congressman Baird's office for sponsoring it. Uh, you can follow the activities of the Congressional Muslim Staff Association, the CMSA, on our website, congressionalmuslims.org. And uh, thank you so much for being here, and we hope to uh, see you again in the future. Take care. In a few moments, President Obama's speech to the nation officially announced